today is developing a study plan. And I want to start this off by asking a question. Do you, this is going to be a yes or no, do you put enough study and work off the tables into your game? Ask yourself an honest question here. So this is what we're going to talk about today. And this is a very, very, very important topic. Some people play poker for fun and studying isn't fun for them. They're not trying to make money. And so they shouldn't study that. Some people are trying to make a very a solid side income from studying, but they only have or from poker, but they only have 10 hours a week to play or dedicate to poker. So there's not a lot of time for them to study. And some people play for a living. And in those cases, they have no excuse. They need to be studying. Or if some people, if your goal is to get to a point where you can make a very, very sustainable income from poker, you need to be studying a lot. And it's about aligning up those goals and motivations with what you're trying to achieve. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And goals of this webinar, we're going to talk about the different types of studying. Um, these are my opinions. I don't, these aren't like clinically psychology, like proven ways to study, but this is how I think about studying. How much time should you spend studying? How to approach studying, exercise to perform while studying, and how to uh, structure how to structure your studying in a very efficient way. And I saw that a couple of times in the questions box. It's not about quantity studying. It's about efficiency. It's better to study one hour very efficiently than it is two hours inefficiently. And so it's about finding ways that are the most efficient ways to study. So first, let's talk about types of studying. And these are the five types of studying that I focus on and um, that I'm going to recommend today. There's other types, but I think these are the five. Uh, these are the five that I think are the most important. So first, drill work. Second, deep dive study. Third, review. Fourth, mental game. And fifth, coaching. So let's go a little bit into what I mean by each of these types of study. So drill work. What I mean by drill work is drill work studying is meant to be very quick, instant feedback studying. So what the best example I can think of when I'm talking about drill work, and I'll have more specific poker examples, uh, but would be if you're studying for a test in school, a lot of people probably use flashcards for memorization. Flashcard study would be very, very good. Uh, I'm a sports fan. To connect it back to sports, drill work would be, as for an NBA player, dribbling drills, free throw drills, um, different types of those fundamentals that you're trying to improve on every single day. That's what I mean by drill work, and it's extremely important, and people don't spend enough time on it. We'll get the more specifics of each of these in a few. Deep dive work is that nitty gritty studying, learning about specific topics. Maybe you want to study check raising and learn about the fundamentals of check raising. You want to study three bet pots in depth. Um, in the sports world, I would study, compare deep dive work as a film study for a team getting ready to play another team. They're gonna watch film. They're going to watch film on the other team and try to figure out their strategies. This is like that deep nitty gritty work to try to learn. And these are where you're really learning new topics and how to implement them correctly. Very different than drill work where you're trying to refine your skills that you already know very well. Deep dive is starting to develop new skills. Review is just what it is. It's reviewing previous hands that you've played. So um, this is going to be a lot of reviewing marked hands that you played that I will talk about, reviewing hand histories, um, and reviewing your statistics in a program like Poker Tracker to make sure your, your strategies are lining up with what you want. Um, mental game. This is its own little topic. Um, a lot of work can be done on the mental game, and that can be divided in so many ways. But the mental game right now is poker is not how it was, you know, eight years ago where you could simply read a book, perform a very cookie cutter strategy and make a lot of money. The mental game um, and performing at your peak is a very, very important uh, part of poker and uh, winning at the maximum possible win rates that you can win at. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done in your mental game. 
And finally, I did coaching. That's kind of a fifth topic. It's mainly these four topics, mostly the top three in terms of actual types of studying. But coaching is going to be one-on-one -on -one coaching, and that's going to be private coaching. And we'll get into that a little bit later on in this webinar. So drill work is the first type of uh, studying we're going to talk about. And as I mentioned, this is quick, quick feedback studying, similar to using flashcards when studying in school. And the objective is have answers already and drill yourself on those. So the best examples of drill work is going to be practicing equities in Equilab, Holden Resources Calculator, push fold call ranges. If you watched my webinar two weeks ago, where we did the uh, work with five big blinds, seven and a half big blinds, 10, 12 and a half, we created the game to study our all in and fold ranges. That is the perfect example of drill work uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, Pre-flop range practice and using a uh, poker training software such as uh, there's a couple of apps out there like a DTO, a couple others that you get to play against a, a computer generated um, GTO strategies and you get to play hands against them to practice GTO um, poker. So uh, my favorite drill work um poker poker pokercoaching.com quizzes very good form of drill work you're getting instant feedback um that's the type of th stuff we're talking about here with drill work uh, hrc push fold call exercises uh, that's going to be similar to my webinar two weeks ago where we uh did that i'm going to show some examples of some of these drills in a second equilab random flop generator generating equities and strategies pre-flop range quizzing and as I said, using a software such as DTO or simple post-flop to train GTO strategies. So let's look at a few of these drill works and show you how I would do them. Uh, first, PC.com quizzes. Um, you guys all know how to do these. If you guys, these PC.com quizzes are really, really good warm-ups before you play. Um, 30 minutes before, an hour before, drill work is very good in terms of your warm-up for poker. It's quick, instant feedback, and it gets your mind thinking in poker mode, okay? So drill work is really good to do as a pre-session warm-up. You're not learning a new topic. You're refining the strategies that you always use. So I would the best recommendation I can make for you guys is to add these drill works to your pre-game uh, pre warm-ups, 30 minutes of work before you start playing. Um, I'll show you an example really quick. We did this two weeks ago. I'll do a quick example of how I would do an HRC push fold call drill work exercise. Um, hold on resources calculator. I've already ran a 10 big blind simulation. So I'm gonna work on my 10 big blind button range. So what I'm gonna do here is fill out what I think I should be shoving, all 10 big blinds. I think every ace on the button, all my pairs. Uh, I think there's some button here, all broadways we're going to be shoving. I think we'll be shoving every suited king. I think we'll be shoving like queen seven suited or better, all these suited eights, eight, seven, seven, six, king nine, um, king eight, and something like this. So this is what I'm going to guess that we shove for 10 big blinds on the button. And this is what I mean by I already have the answer solved. So I'm going to go in here now, go to my button, 10 big blind, and compare my answers. And as you can see here, um, I could have shoved a few more suited queens. Uh, all these suited sevens I can shove, so I'm too tight there. Uh, suited connectors, I could even shove six, five, five, four suited, king eight off. I could have shoved king seven, king six off. The whole point here is I'm learning right away all these off suit nines I could have shoved. I was too tight in my shoving range, okay? Now, that took all of 30 seconds for me to do. So now I'm gonna do a different position. I'm gonna do uh, one to nine. Um, one to eight because we can't shove in the big blind so position one is under the gun so eight is going to be the small blind okay so now i'm going to do my small blind range and this is very similar to what we did two weeks ago so from the small blind i know i can shove any suited queen um i can shove all these man we could shove super wide we're going to be shoving 10 5 10 4 i think we can shove all these all these offsuit eights any king i think we shove any queen um, jack five off. I think these offsuit sevens are going to be shoves. I think something like this is what we're going to be able to shove here for 10 big blinds in the small blind. Okay. Um, so we're going to, um, go to small blind here and here we go. Every offsuit queen. We're good. Jack five off. We're perfect there. Offsuit sevens. We're perfect there. 
these are really marginal shoves. Um, we were a little tight here, Jack Deuce suited, 10-3 suited, um, depending on how big we want. So we were pretty close here. We were off by a couple of things. So, okay, I just drilled my 10 big blind, small blind range. Do it for seven and a half big blinds. Do it for 12 and a half, 15, five, seven and a half. I did a whole webinar on this two weeks ago, so go check that out. That's one of my favorite drill exercises and something you need to know in tournaments because um, this comes up a lot. Equilab, random flop generators, okay? So what we can do in Power Equilab here, let's say actually, let's say we want to study a uh, button versus cutoff. I actually have some ranges here. So I'm going to do 100 big blinds, my button, 100 big blind opening range, okay? I'm going to do big blind, and I have a, um, I have, let's see here, I should have, I don't have my defending ranges in here. Big blind versus button, 100 big blinds, okay? So I have a big blind opening range, a big blind defending range, and I'm going to generate a random flop here. Ace, queen, eight. And I'm going to start to guess equities, and I'm going to get better at training myself of realize, recognizing equity advantage. I'll make an Excel sheet, record my results, ace, queen, eight. Uh, this is a really, really good board for us. I think we're going to be upwards of like 57, 58%. All right, 58.8. Let's generate a new flop. Ace, queen, seven. That's very similar. Queen, 10, eight. Queen, 10, four. Um, probably going to be less. I think we're going to be around 55%. All right, 55%. Boom. 987. Um, we might even be, we're not an equity dog here, but we're not much. I'm going to say about like 52%. All right. So I'm going through here, working on my range advantages, work on 100 big blinds, work on 50 big blinds. How do your range advantages change when you're at 50 big blinds, 20 big blinds, 30 big blinds? There's so many situations you can do here. This is button versus big blind. Do under the gun versus big blind, middle position versus big blind. Set up an Excel sheet, record all your results. Again, this is instant feedback, and we're recognizing our equities. If you don't understand why you have a range advantage, you can go into a tool like the uh, Range Explorer, look into the both ranges and figure out uh, where your range advantage comes from. Um, these are very, very powerful drill exercises that are gonna help you in game to analyze these spots very, very, very quickly. Uh, Pre-flop range quizzing, okay? Another really, really good drill exercise we're gonna do here, pre-flop ranges. You need to know pre-flop ranges. You make these decisions every single time in a hand. What I got here uh, from poker coaching, I have the 40 big blind GTO charts. So let's do, um, okay, 40 big blind, low jack opening range, okay? So we're gonna do 40 big blinds in the low jack. I'm gonna clear all this. So what hands are we going to be raising for 40 big blinds in the low jack? I think we're going to be raising ace nine off or better. This is going to be like a marginal open ace eight. So I'll put it in red, make red my marginal or weighted opens. Um, I think every suited ace is going to be open. I think for 40 in the low jack, I don't think we raise deuces. And then I think threes are going to be like weighted. Uh, Obviously, we're going to raise all these suited broadways. I think we get to open all the offsuit broadways. I think Jack 10 is probably going to be mixed at 40. Um, King 9, I think King 7, maybe King 6 suited is weighted. Uh, all these suited 8s are going to be open. And then 8, 7. And then some of these suited connectors are going to be weighted. And, and uh, this offsuit like nine sevens probably so this is my range i'm guessing for the low jack 40 big blinds okay i'm gonna pull up the chart now and compare again same principles we have the results and we want to we're just drilling ourselves okay so low jack um here we look ace nine off or better i was perfect there ace eight off not a marginal open ace two suited or better uh king five suited okay uh, let me zoom in on this for you guys uh here we go. So we're on this one right here, the low jack. King five suited. So it's actually, and then I'll put green the ones I was off on. So green, uh, I was off a little tight on these. Suited eights, I was perfect. Nine, seven suited. Eight, seven suited. Seven, six suited. So these I was off on. And then I was right, deuces, but it's actually fours, threes, and deuces that I'm too tight on. So I was pretty close. I don't need to be perfect, but I realized uh, there was some 
spots here that I was uh, a little bit off on my opening ranges. So need to work on that one a little bit. Um, let's go to my button range. We'll do one more here. Clear hand grip. Uh, button. Okay. I'm just going to start with um, all pairs, all broadways, uh, every ace. Uh, we're going to do every suited king. I think uh, we're opening every suited queen. We're going to say like jack four suited or better. All these suited connectors, um, suited one gappers, suited there, um, king five off or better. All these offsuit nines, all these offsuit eights. Um, what is this? About 49%. This is pretty close. I think I might be a little bit tight. Eight five suited. So let's look now on the button. Okay, same exercise. Offsuit aces, I'm good. King six, so I was a little wrong there. Queen seven, I missed. So I was good on all my offsuit stuff. I was only off by two combos. Uh, six, four, five, four, so I was just five, three suited I was off on. Eight, five, nine, five, 10, five, so I was off on these suited fives, and then uh, jack three. So right away in 10, four. I was really close here, I was off by 1%. So I know I know my button opening range pretty well. So that was uh, good. And you're just going through these. Uh, use a random number generator is really good. Get a random number generator, search on Google. You can find one to download and just do it by position. So one is under the gun, eight is small blind. So this would be uh, four, uh, position five, position one. And you could even run a second number and do different stack sizes, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 big blinds. Quiz yourself on all these different ranges. You need to know pre-flop ranges and you don't want to be uh, spending a lot of time thinking about them in game. Don't do just raise first in, do flatting. So we're gonna do, we could do, we're in the cutoff with 40 big blinds facing a hijack open. So cutoff versus, you know, see if we have that range in here. Uh, cutoff versus low jack, hijack, raise first in. We have the range right there, okay? We could go through it train it, find where our three bets are, find where our, our calls are and compare it to the actual ranges. It's a drill meant to be quick and get good quick feedback. So I think you guys get the idea of drill work here. Um, very, very important and something that's gonna take up a lot of your study time. And I'm, I have, I'll show you a little bit later how I break down my study time. So now we're gonna do review study and this will go a little bit quicker now. Reviewing and studying your hands. Um, three different ways that I talk about this. So the first is marked hands. If you don't, if you use poker tracker and you don't know how to mark hands, uh, you need to learn how to. So if you go here, configure tags in poker tracker, you can add as many tags as you want. And I tend to uh, label my tags. I have three bet pot in position, three bet pot out of position, big blind defense, single race pot, um, ICM spots. Uh, Pre-flop push fold call, PFC, that's for me. I have a lot of those. Pre-flop ranges, those are just hands I want to check. Pre-flop ranges, rejam, uh, reviews, etc. So these are all the hands I've marked since uh, May 1st. I have 194 hands marked that I haven't gone through yet. And I have a very simple strategy where I'm like, I'll spend, you know, say I have an hour, I might be able to get through seven or eight of these hands. I'm going to go through, and these are specific hands that I marked because um, because I wasn't sure what to do in game. So anytime there's a spot that I don't know what to do in game, I'm going to mark the hand. So I'm going to replay this pocket sevens hand. I actually already reviewed this. Um, so I played this hand. I was on the button. 40 big blinds effective. A good regular raised to 10,000 in early position. I flatted on the button. Flop king, queen, nine deuce, two clubs. He bet 10,000, I called, I wasn't very, I knew this was very standard. What I didn't know was on the turn. The turn was a club and our opponent checked. I didn't know if I should start checking this hand now on the turn or if I should start turning my hand into a bluff. Um, I ended up checking back and then the river was the three of spades. Um, my opponent bet pretty large and I folded. And I wasn't really sure uh, about the turn and the river play, if I should ever shove the river as a bluff, if I should make a small block bet on the turn to buy a free showdown. Um, so this is a hand I didn't really want, uh, wasn't really sure what to do. 
And I actually ran this in PO Solver. Um, I put the ranges in, I did a bunch of different betting options. And remember my questions were specifically on the turn and the river. So as a very quick review of how I would study a marked hand here, I'm gonna put in the action that happened. Uh, our opponent bet the turn. Um, I'm not going super in depth here because I'm trying to answer specific questions that I have about this hand. Pocket sevens with the seven of diamonds or clubs. My hand is a pure call on the turn. The turn was the four clubs and this is where my question started. Our opponent checked and my hand is pretty much a pure check on the turn. I'm not supposed to bluff with my hand. And um, I kind of looked through the strategy and I just have a lot of other hands that I want to block bluff with here. I have like all the ace jacks, ace tens, king tens with a club in them. I start bluffing with king jack with the king of clubs or the jack of clubs I can bluff with. Um, even hands like uh, ace six of hearts, king ten of hearts. I have all these different hands that I can bluff with that don't have as much showdown with value with pocket sevens. Um, so I checked back and then the river was the, uh, three of spades, three of spades and our opponent bet, um, 128, about 70% of the pot. And my hand is mixing fold and call. And so generally I would assume that this is probably a pure fold for me because our opponent probably isn't finding the right amount of bluffs here, I would think. So, uh, in general, my hand is mostly going to be a fold. I did more in-depth analysis on the hand in terms of how is our opponent supposed to play and does this strategy make sense? Um, and this is a spot I actually I found out what I studied here and learned was that um, I should actually be over bluffing this spot because the out of position player should be checking a ton of flushes and slow playing a lot on this turn and checking a lot to us. And most people don't, their checking range ends up being very weak and we can really attack it with all those King Jack, King Tens, Ace Jack, Ace Tens hands with a club in it on all our heart draw floats. So um, that was kind of a very short, quick way of how I go through and study some of these marked hands. Um, a lot of these are simple spots too, like this is a push fold call spot. So it folded to the button who made it 5,000. Uh, the small blind flatted and I had ace four suited and we were playing about 40 big blinds effective and I actually just went up to went ahead and jammed for about 35 big blinds effective here um, with the ace four suited in the big blind um, I can copy and paste this into um, hold them resources calculator uh, adjust their ranges to what I think they are and see if this is going to be how plus EV the shove is um, so this is how I go through and do a lot of my marked hands. Uh, ran, random hand history pull up uh, for review. Very, very self-explanatory. So I'm gonna just go through Poker Tracker and I'm gonna pull up a random hand history that I played. Uh, and it could be a deep run, it could be a, doesn't really matter for this. What I'm trying to do is make sure that um, I can go through and I'm just going through, I'm double checking my preflop open raises. I'm checking my flat calls and three bets against my preflop charts. I'm identifying any situations that I'm unsure of what I'm supposed to do, and I'm gonna study them more. Uh, the whole thing is just review your hands and make sure that you're following the strategies that you're set out. Um, ran, random history pull-ups are really good to find out, am I playing too many tables? Am I making very simple mistakes I shouldn't be making? Uh, is my focus, you know, these are where you identify like some mental game issues where you're just making very, very simple mistakes. Maybe you're playing too many tables, that type of stuff. I'm gonna skip over this because it's not as important as these first two and I wanna make sure I get through the other stuff as well. Um, if we have time, we'll come back to that. Uh, deep dive study work, okay? This is gonna be a deep dive into a specific topic or situation, okay? Uh, this is gonna be topic based. So for example, maybe you wanna work on your check raising. Maybe you wanna work on three bet pots out of position. Maybe you wanna look at big blind defense. Um, situation based as well. Um, yesterday, I spent an hour and a half doing deep dive study work on playing out of position with 40 big blinds. So I want, I've been working on my C betting and flop play out of position. And so um, I did under the gun versus button um, 40 big blind play. Uh, again, I use PO Solver a lot for this for aggregated reports. Uh, I'll just show it here. I won't spend too much time on this. 
but you guys have in my past webinars have seen me pull up spreadsheets as such um, and I made a note file with my notes that I did while I'm studying this is my uh, hour and a half I spent studying about so I have my ranges here under the gun and button these are the ranges and this is, this is just here this first page is the parameters of what I was using in PO solver for all the different flops and I started off, what are the best boards for out of position? When I'm playing 40 big blinds, I raise under the gun, the button flats. That's the situation. And I, there's a very, very clear pattern I found out. The best boards pretty intuitively are any boards with like an ace king, ace queen, ace king, ace queen. So they were all the Broadway boards interacting with our ace king, ace queen combos. Um, ace Broadway, Broadway combos, king queen boards, ace queen jack. Um, and so these are just my notes that I was finding through my deep dive study. And then I had the best boards for the in-position player are, and clear pattern. They were all low connected boards where there's straights possible. So I went in depth and did some bet sizing and just studying that entire situation. That's not the point of this webinar is what my results were. But going through, taking notes, studying situations. If you don't have something like PO solver to study these on your own. Let's say uh, check raising is something you want to work on. I would go on pokercoaching.com. I would go through the um, classes and webinars. And I would start to search, um, for example, if I'm looking for check raising, I know Jonathan Jaffe has a great uh, check raise uh, webinar. It's pretty sure I've watched that before. Uh, button versus big blind overbetting. Maybe when to check raise flops, all right? He has a whole webinar on check raising flops. I would go through, watch this whole webinar on check raising flops. Then I want to apply what I learned. Um, I would go through my hands and find hands where I'm put into a spot with check raising. I'd start reviewing my hands where I could be check raising. I would start to um, analyze all these spots, analyze my play. The biggest tip I have with watching videos, and this is important, and I feel this is going to apply to a lot of people here. If you let's say the webinar is one hour long, okay, it should take you an hour and a half to two hours to watch that webinar. You should be pausing the webinar. You should be taking notes. You should be trying to answer the questions before the instructor answers them. You need to be spending the time to find out what you know and what you don't know and taking the notes, reviewing them. A lot of these webinars are very dense and you need to watch them a couple of times to understand. So making sure that you're actually putting the time in to make sure you understand the topic find videos and webinars on the selected topic so filtering you can uh filter your database in poker tracker 4 for a specific situation like uh when you're defending the big blind or when you're check raising and go through all those hands uh on the specific situation so my favorite deep dive work is going to be aggregated report work like I showed, um, running the simulations, and then I like to learn by categorizing flop textures and categorizing, learning the equities and different uh, pattern recognition on grouping flops together. Um, I'm guessing the equities, I, I work on the frequencies and sizings of my strategies on different flop textures. Uh, mental game work, often overlooked strategy. Um, my two favorite poker books are The Mental Game of Poker 1 and 2. Um, if you have not read these books, I highly recommend you read them. Uh, there's a lot of mental game uh, content out there. Um, if you're not implementing mental game work into your game, uh, there's a lot that you can be missing on out in terms of expectation and win rates. And so... Um, I think the mental game of poker one and two are very, very good places to start and really completing all the exercises in the book. Just don't passively read the book. Take time to do the exercises and drills in the book. That's how you get the most out of them. Um, mental game stuff I put in there. I put a lot of work in it, but there's a lot of topics. I've worked one on one with a performance coach before. Uh, it's something that I spend a lot of time working on to make sure that I am performing at my peak when I do play. And then finally, um, I'll talk about coaching and mostly private coaching, uh, using a coach to help identify and fix leaks in your game. 
uh, I think it's best for semi-professionals or professional players. Uh, but the m main reason I put coaching here is I want to talk about you must use coaching effectively. And a lot of people don't use coaching effectively. Um, it's very important to come prepared with specific questions and hands. Um, there are students that will come with, with nothing prepared to sessions. They want to um, just tell me what to do. And I can tell anyone what to do, but it's not going to stick and it will be a short term fix. Um, the students that get the most out of coaching are the ones that put the most work into it. Just like with poker, uh, it takes a lot of effort and work to get the most out of it. Um, include hands you both win and loss, lose that you send to your coach. So the main form of coaching will be a hand history review. And a lot of students send me hands that they lose. And they associate losing with making a mistake and assume when they win the hand that they didn't make a mistake. So including hands that you both win and lose is very important. Uh, otherwise, it's a very, very um, slippery slope in terms of not being able to identify the proper leaks in your game. Uh, do work on your own before asking your coach. So um, try to work out situations and what you think correct strategies are before asking the coach. This is gonna give you a better understanding and a better um, way to uh, identify and learn from the session. And rewatch sessions. Uh, oftentimes you might need to rewatch a coaching session two or three times to get a point to stick. Um, it's a uh, very dense a lot of the times when you work with a private coach. Forming a group. I think this is a very, very underlooked and important part of studying. Find like-minded peers to study with, okay? Find a group of two to three people, and not just any two to three people. Find two to three people that have the same goals and passion that you do. And that's probably the hardest part, is to find a uh, those same people and pa uh, that have the same passion that you do about um, coaching. Do hand history reviews together. One week, review one person's hand history. The next week, review the other person's hand history together. Talking through these hands together, getting other points of view, um, this is very important. Uh, do deep dive analysis together. Drill each other in the drills section. Talk hands together. Um, have a Skype chat open. You can copy and paste hand histories there to get opinions on those hands. Uh, Forming a group is very, very important. Talk to people. Don't be afraid to ask people, hey, you know, I'm going to be studying later this week. Um, I have, you know, different people that I talk poker with. I'll send out a message. Nothing. Hey, um, tomorrow at 2 p.m. I'm going to be doing some deep dive study for a couple hours. If you want to join me, great. I'll send it to a few people. Maybe one of them shows up. Maybe a couple of them show up and we'll go through some stuff together. If not, you know, I'll study on my own. Uh, but, you know, reach out to like-minded people. Um, if you're playing live poker, you know, talk to other regulars that you respect in the game. Don't talk to the person that you know never studies their game and isn't trying to improve. Try to talk to the people that are, you know, that you respect and think are good players. Be hey, you want to go grab coffee and um, talk, you know, compare notes or compare reads on other players. Compare, um, you know, how do you play these situations? How do you play these situations? You know. Talking in a group is still a very, very, very important. There's still tons of poker forums out there you can post hands on. PC.com resources, homeworks. I capitalized an explanation at this point, and I'm gonna put like 10 explanation points on this one, okay? Quizzes on PC.com. I'm sure a lot of you are doing quizzes. Those are kind of the backbone of poker.coaching.com. These are really important. Um, Rewatch webinars. Uh, there's so many webinars. I've done probably close to 100 webinars now. I don't know. Actually, that's probably not true. Maybe 50 webinars. Um, all of here under classics or classes. And uh, they're so. Jonathan Jaffe has 11 and 0. Let's see how many webinars I have on here. 47 webinars I have on here. That's like 47 hours of content here. You know, go through those specific topics, find a specific topic that you want to work on. Uh, range Analyzer, you've seen me use that. This tool is great for analyzing your own hands. So, study to play. People are asking, how much should I be studying? How much you should be playing? And it's, I cannot answer that question for you. You need to ask yourself what your goals are 
and what your motivations are in poker. Why are you playing poker? Are you playing to make a living and support your family? Are you playing for fun? Are you play, playing for the intellectual challenge? For someone, let's just say as a broad example, I would say if you have 40 hours available, play poker every week, you know, I would say, okay, 30 hours of play, 10 hours of study. You know, depending on your skill level, um, you can, if you're playing full time, you need to be doing a lot of study. If you're playing part time, if you're playing for fun, you know, the amount of study you do depends on your goals. And the key thing I want to point out here is think of studying as earning money in the future, investing in the stock market. You're investing money now for long term results in the future. And that's exactly what you're doing when you're studying. Uh, I used to have the problem that I didn't want to study because I thought my time was better off playing. And that's just not true because I'm actually making money while I'm studying, even though I'm not playing. Um, you're improving your win rate for a slow and gradual long term return. Poker has changed. There was a time where you did not need to study. You could crush games by reading a book or two and playing tight. This is not the case anymore. The game has evolved. Those that don't study and improve will be passed by in this game. There are so many people that used to be winning poker players that are losing poker players now because they don't study and haven't improved their games and the game has passed them by. In terms of poker in 2020, resources are available everywhere to improve your game. Uh, there's, I mean, Twitch, YouTube, pokercoaching.com, so many like resources out there. Like, Take advantage of them. There's really no reason not to. Uh, have excuses for not improving your game um it's only excuses what are your goals in poker what do you want to accomplish and then um i'm going to show you this spreadsheet um this is kind of my study spreadsheet for the month of june so i was making my schedule um i was making my schedule for the month of june and i dedicated 36 hours total of study time for June. This is actually my goals for the month of June, uh, 36 hours. And I break that down to nine hours a week. And I tried to break it down in terms of how I'm going to spend time in terms of drill work, review, deep dive, mental game work, um, coaching. Right now, I'm not working with anyone in terms of uh, no one's coaching. I'm doing all my studying on my own. Uh, so I broke it down in terms of drill work. Um, I think I'm, I'm doing about eight hours of drill work a lot of hours of review work. Um, so it's a pretty equal, for me personally, I'm doing a lot of review, drill work, deep dive mental game work. So right now for some people, this mental game work won't be as high. Uh, they can divide their hours between deep dive, review and drill work. Uh, I think the mo two most important ones are review and drill work. Uh, those are the two most important ones and they kind of work together. Um, Set a goal for the month. How many hours do you want to study for the month? Okay, break it down then. How many hours a week do I need to study to meet that goal? Okay, then break it down. How many hours of drill work do I want to do? So for example, a lot of this drill work, eight hours of drill work is going to come before my sessions. So for example, I'm starting my session at 4 p.m. today, um, Pacific, Pacific time, an hour after this webinar. I will be spending 30 to 45 minutes doing drill work uh, before I start playing, probably mostly uh, using DTO uh, to get some practice hands in, uh, maybe some push fold call work that I will do. Okay. Uh, I might also do some pre flop range work that I that will do. Uh, my deep dive study work is never on a day that I play. Deep dive work only comes on days that I take off and I'm not playing. All right. Normally I'll have a theme for the for the week. So like I said before, uh, my theme right now for deep dive study work is out of position, uh, OOP uh, strategies, strategies. So this is uh, when I raise in like middle position, the button, the cutoff calls. So I'm working all month on out of position strategies um, in my deep dive work and working on trying to incorporate those into my game all month. Uh, mental game work, I'm going through some courses and rereading some books on mental game and identifying like tilt issues in my game, um, trying to make sure that I'm maximizing my performance. So that's kind of what I got for today.